Hi, everyone. I'm Kathleen McGowan, one of the PhDs in musicology at UIUC. I'm here with Alex, Jaquan, and Rebecca, the three graduate student conductors of the Illinois Wind Orchestra, the Illinois Wind Symphony, and the Heinsley Symphonic Band. Conductors, maybe we could begin by introducing yourselves and telling us which pieces you'll be conducting during the concerts next week. Yeah, I'll start. My name's Alex Mondragon. I'm a second year DMA wind conducting student here. Um, this semester, I'm serving as the TA with the Wind Orchestra. And so on Tuesday night with them, I will conduct James David's Urban Light. Um, and then as you already have said, Kathleen, we all work with the Wind Symphony. Um, and Wednesday evening, I'll conduct a chamber ensemble on Edgar Varese's Octandra. My name is Rebecca Mulligan. I'm a second year master's student here in conducting. As well, I am a TA with the University Band, which meets on Monday nights, but our concert isn't for another month or so. I am conducting on the chamber uh, concert as well, and I'm conducting Nocturno for Winds by Felix Mendelssohn. And my name is Jaquan Wiley, and I'm a first year master's student here at the University of Illinois. Uh, and on Tuesday night, I will be conducting a piece entitled Contra Key Rose, which was originally written for a choir by Morton Lordson, uh, but was transcribed for band uh, by H. Robert Reynolds. And then on Wednesday night, for the chamber cycle, I'll be conducting a piece by Gataj Copley entitled Serenade for a Wind Nonette. Um, I'll start. The Nocturno for the Chamber concert um, is the first piece on the program and probably good. It helps get our feet wet a bit before we go to Alex's piece, Octandra, which is basically diving into the deep end. And if you attend the concert, you'll hear how vastly different those two pieces are. Um, Dr. Giraldi assigns us the pieces. He programs the music and then assigns us each a piece that we get to conduct on the chamber um, the chamber concert. And for me, like exploring this piece with the musicians has been really rewarding because of the two different sections that this, that my piece presents. The first section being more uh, legato and smooth and beautiful in timbre, and the second section being more energetic and building energy towards the end through faster tempos and light articulations. Um, Something that I have been working on personally with this is, especially in the second section, is learning how to just not have as much control, trusting the musicians. They know what they're doing and I need to get out of their way. And that's been a really like big reward to look at our first rehearsal and see the growth from them and from me. It's been really rewarding. Chuck, uh, would you be willing to go next? Yeah, sure. So um, the, um, I guess what the chamber music, I guess, um, the, that piece was also, uh, that was assigned to me by Dr. Giraldi. Um, and actually I've had the opportunity to, um, to work a lot with um, Katash Copley's music. And so uh, before I came to the University of Illinois, um, one, I did one of his pieces with uh, one of our high school ensembles, uh, his piece in Living Color. Um, and so that was that, and then kind of just studying a few of his other works, uh, just kind of on my own time. And so I was really excited to be able to study uh, this piece and really work with an ensemble on this piece, um, because it allows me to kind of uh, explore a different uh, setting uh, of a uh, different setting of Kataj's music. And, um, you know, his piece is actually really uh, interesting and almost kind of programmatic in a way. And traditionally and historically, serenades are uh, songs of courtship and multi movement works and about love and such. And uh, but he said that uh, he wrote this in his program notes that he kind of his first idea for this was kind of like an anti serenade in a bit. So uh, the instrumentation is just a little different. Uh, it's you know it's not he might he substitutes what could be a what could be an, uh, uh, an oboe part for a soprano saxophone, what could be a bassoon part for a baritone saxophone. So he kind of just messes with the instrumentation a little bit. Um, and it's also a piece that he says that instead of it being about love, it's about kind of growth um, and kind of follows this uh, character from you know leaving one relationship and growing and being hopeful and kind of entering into a new, uh, you know, relationship uh, with a significant other. So each movement kind of follows that journey. Um, it's, it's in four different movements. And so 
the first movement is very, you know, kind of somber, kind of the, the beginning stages of trying to figure oneself out. Uh, the next movement is kind of this chance and quirky encounter with, uh, you know, with, with this other person. Um, the third movement is kind of this little, uh, this, this waltz, kind of this dance as they kind of go, go on these first dates and kind of figuring each other out. And then uh, the last one uh, is entitled dance. And so it's kind of this, uh, this dance of uh, love, this dance of growth and hope, uh, you know, kind of as they, you know, uh, admit their love for one another. So it's, uh, so I, it's, it's, it's a really neat piece. It's, uh, it's very, very colorful. Um, and it's, it's, it's uh, wonderful literature. It sounds it. I don't know this composer, but I will after the concert next week, I think. Um, Alex, you were saying that you got to choose one of your pieces. Uh, I did, with... yeah. Um, sorry to cut you short there. I apologize. Um, with wind orchestra, the way Professor Barry Hauser, who's the, the faculty member in charge of that ensemble, does it, he, he'll ask the graduate student assigned with him to um, give some suggestions of pieces they'd like to do. Um, and so throughout the summer, I, I took some time to find a list of pieces and put things together that I thought would fit the ensemble um, from an artistic merit standpoint, from a difficulty standpoint, from um, programming variety standpoint to just, you know, attack a program at different directions. Um, and he and I both kind of landed on Urban Light by James David, which is uh, just a really fantastic little piece and a lot of fun. It features electric guitar with distortion, which is a color you don't get to hear from the concert band very often. Um, and so it just, it provides a bunch of different sound worlds and it's, it's a quality composition that uses thematic material that's developed in ways so we can talk about the theory and composition side about this idea uh, that David uses of Morse code. He spells out the word California and it's broken into a couple different chunks. There's chunks that spell Cali and chunks that spell Fornia and you can find the rhythms all throughout in different parts uh of different sections playing those pieces of the word and so these all of these varieties of um different variables that make the piece what it is kind of come together to create a, a valuable experience for the students uh that's fun to play interesting to study and i think really really fun to listen to for the audience and so that's kind of how we landed on that one cool oh uh I'm teaching a course in very early music right now. We've been talking about rhythmic modes and ciphers, and it's really cool to see contemporary composers using a similar technique uh, to get sort of hidden ideas into their music uh, yeah. the same way that David's doing with Morse code. That's so cool. Yeah. How do the pieces that you're getting to conduct reflect your philosophies of teaching or musicianship? Um, you're in a really important leadership role with the ensemble, and the students have a lot of opportunities to get to know you as musicians, but also look up to you in a lot of ways. Uh, Jaquan, would you be willing to start? Sure. Um, you know, I, well, the different settings that we get that we get to work in we get a chance to spend a lot of time with a lot of full ensembles uh and so there are many aspects of full ensemble playing that are that are really great and kind of what helps to drive those those full ensemble moments uh, is the time spent with the chamber repertoire, actually, you know, those those truly uh, intimate settings um, in many ways uh, allows us to use some of those similar techniques and ideas that we do in those chamber settings and for the players to use a, a, a different set of skills that they can then apply to things that are in a, a, that are in the full band setting. So, um, you know, I think that um Chamber playing uh, really helps to uh, evolve a lot of the um, uh, a lot of aspects of the of higher level musicianship, um, and then I also think that in the um, I'll take the piece I'm doing with Hinesley for example. You know, I think that is really good because it's important for uh, players to really get a chance to really concentrate on, say, uh, intonation, for example, and really being able to communicate with each other really being able to communicate with the conductor and the conductor being able to really um, take the time to invest in, uh, uh, in expression. And, um, and and really it also, it kind of crosses to mediums, right? So, you know, I mentioned that the, you know, it was originally written for choir. So we've been, I've been able to pull some of those elements uh, of choral conducting and choral music kind of into the concert band medium a little bit. Um, and so there, uh, and, 
really any chance I you know I get get to work with any kind of works that were then written for something else. Most of the time, choir works that have been transcribed for a concert band. Um, you know, it's really interesting to kind of hear the different colors and harmonies and textures that you may not necessarily get to hear with a with a choir. Get to hear that for uh, with a concert band. So, um, yeah, I think that it's uh, th that. There are uh, there are many ideas uh, and many things uh, that that are that are great that, that could be combined between both. Rebecca, would you say similarly? Oh, absolutely. Um, typically, for wind symphony, when we're in a full ensemble setting, I've been really fortunate to actually play within the clarinet section. So I am typically sitting amongst the musicians and experiencing the music from the standpoint of a player. And so when I get to be on the podium. It, it allows for a different conversation to be made. And it, I, I try and approach chamber music as if like, how would I practice this? How am I going to conduct this or lead this rehearsal in the same way that I might practice this? And it, because the setting is more intimate and more vulnerable since there are fewer people, it allows for different conversations to be had musically speaking. And um, it's been, it's been fun figuring out, like, as we go through the rehearsal process, figuring out, like, which lines need to come out more or uh, which inflections are, is Mendelssohn bringing out in the texture and discovering that from each other. So really, for me, it's been a shift from a player's perspective to the conductor's perspective that um, has helped me kind of further establish my philosophies within this piece. I yeah, I think again, you had to choose your repertoire. So I feel like th there might be a little bit more of you in that choice because it wasn't assigned. Yeah, I think the, the two pieces that I'm doing are very different. They're not not even close. The, <laughs> the way that David speaks to my own philosophies and values, I've kind of, I kind of described when I was just talking about it a minute ago, but, you know, finding things that are of artistic merit, finding pieces of music that I think are composed well, that take an idea and develop it and take us on a journey and really uh, create something deeper than just a song to be played. Uh, and I think that's prevalent throughout the David, not to mention the fact that we got to collaborate with the guitar studio and we're featuring a guitarist DMA uh, as our electric guitar player. So tons of tons of value there. Uh, Octandre, on the other hand, is one of the pieces of the repertoire that you don't get to play every day. It's for eight people. It's incredibly difficult. And it is... Uh, we'll say not a very easy listen the first time around. It's got very different sound concepts. Uh, and the way that Varese writes his music is not the way that Mendelssohn wrote Nocturno or the way that Copley wrote The Serenade. This is, a, a, it's built on sound masses. It's built on repetitive pitches with varied rhythms. It's built on an idea of half steps, which inherently are dissonant. It's built with dynamic contrast from like four or five Fs all the way to four or five Ps. And so from basically very, very loud to very, very soft. Um, and not to mention that just the rhythms are entire, like super complex and very independent. And so this is getting into the, the realm of like more of the high art thinking and the art, you know, we're, we're doing this as an artistic experience and the education is in that you're inherently pulling from the value of art and working through this and creating something um, and getting to experience a piece that's really a standard in the chamber wind repertoire, uh, but isn't performed very often simply because of how challenging it can be. But I think there's a lot in both pieces that really help students and especially where these students all are on their journeys in music. Jaquan, you were saying that you've gotten to play uh, pieces by Copley before. Um, is uh, How has this let you sort of grow in a relationship with the composer's music, getting to play it more than once? Yeah, well, it, it, it's allowed me to really put my ear on his artistic voice. Um, and there are many composers that I can say the same about. Um, I was having a conversation with a colleague just very recently about uh, David Mislanka's music, for example. There's a lot of his music that sounds, that, that has a particular sound to it. And you're like, oh, you know, I, I think if you were to put, um, you know, Percy Granger's music against Aaron Copeland's music, you would be able to tell a difference. Copeland, especially with the, with, with the way that he uses 
you know, chordal and quintal harmonies, you know, there's just, you know, his, he, he has a very American uh, sound to his music. And so, um, you know, it, it's allowed me to really kind of open up and think about not just Copley's music, but also any composer's music. Uh, you know, if someone were to say, hey, you're going to do these three pieces by these three composers. Okay, well, great. And so and then I get to then say, all right, th this is these are the pieces that I'm that that I'm studying and that I'm working on. What else have they done? And kind of how do they view the world? W. Francis Macbeth has a completely different view of the world than Edgar Perez. That's for sure. <laughs> okay, so like if you I, and so I think it's just it's really allowed me to kind of open up and expand a little bit on kind of how I study and how I hear things. Um, and just to, and be able to kind of focus on the way that, you know, Katash Copley writes music, um, you know, has been, has been, has been pretty neat. Turning our ears toward the two concerts next week, uh, Tuesday, October 8th and Wednesday, October 9th. If you could choose one thing, maybe your favorite thing, maybe the most distinctive thing. Uh, what would you recommend that audience members listen for in the pieces that you're conducting? I can start. Um, we'll start with Tuesday's concert with Wind Orchestra and the David Urban Light. Um, I would recommend that folks listen for this idea of a rhythmic motive uh, that's inspired by Morse code. You'll hear it right away in the beginning uh, in the way the trumpets play, rhythmic passages, and the way they articulate it sounds like Morse code. And listen for these repetitive rhythms to see if you can pick out points that he's reusing the same extended rhythmic phrase to spell out those portions of the word California. Um, and in addition, just enjoy the electric guitar because it's really cool with a concert band. Uh, for Octandra on Wednesday night, I would say listen with one, an open mind for the new sounds you're going to hear, uh, but listen for how he uses pitch material. Listen for how the notes work together. Listen for how one voice creates the next and how things blossom out of each other. And when it sounds like it's cacophony, because frankly, it can sound that way sometimes, listen for what is he really trying to get at. He's not just slamming keys on a keyboard as he wrote this, but there's a point, an underlying direction. And so try to find that. So with The Nocturno by Mendelssohn, um, he wrote this piece in 1824 when he was just 14 years old. He's very young, very uh, a go-getter at that time, um, writing many prominent works. For, for The Nocturno, this is now a, a pretty standard chamber piece for wind band. Um, when he wrote this, he initially included Corno de Basso, which translates to English bass horn. And I have a picture pulled up in case he describes it with a beautiful sound, but it looks like a big jug or a stirrup pump, which hopefully you can see it, but it, we don't we don't use this instrument anymore. So uh, we are substituting it with euphonium. Uh, and in addition to euphonium on this piece, it, there's also trumpet. And adding these two flavors of brass to the typical um, harmony music ensemble, flute, oboe, clarinet, horn, bassoon. It adds these different flavors, these different textures that he kind of peppers throughout. And specifically, you'll hear the horn interjecting with these uh, fanfare like dee, da da. And then the euphonium comes in with the bassoon during the first section. And they create this uh, descending eighth note line. So if, if I were to tell audience members to listen for anything specifically, in this piece, I would say listen for the different characters that Mendelssohn uh, writes for these, specifically for these two sections. Um, he writes different characters through the instrumentation, through the harmonies, the articulation. Um, and just imagine that you're a 14 year old Mendelssohn writing this composition and put yourself in, the, in those shoes and imagine how you might interpret that piece as a young bind. Um, I think on uh, next week for the for the Tuesday night concert with the Heisley Symphonic Band and the the Lordson piece, I think I would just want people just to kind of envision a uh, 
you know, well, it envision the the sounds as though they were coming from the human voice. You know, that's what it was originally written for and just kind of, uh, you know, telling and as they're a kind of um, playing through their instruments, this this text and this uh, this poem. Um, and so I think it's just uh, it, it's a piece that I, I just I'd never heard before. Um, another Lords and Reynolds piece that everybody knows is Omani Mysterium. And so, um, you know, again, something that was originally written for choir that was then transcribed by uh, by Bob Reynolds for uh, for concert band. So it was uh, so it's been really, really neat to get to to get to get to know uh, this other piece of uh, literature that's just kind of not, not played quite as often. Um, and then on uh, Wednesday night for the chamber concert, I think I'd like people just to listen to the story. You know, I just I mentioned kind of laid it all out, kind of how this, uh, how each movement kind of progresses, and uh, and kind of hear the the story for yourself, and really try and let your imagination and the imagery kind of just come to mind there. So just kind of follow follow the journey. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, conductors, thank you so much. And uh, to our audience members, I will see you in Fellinger Hall next week.